we're going to talk about just some legal issues today. We could talk about a myriad of different things that you face, but we, we don't have all day, and I'm not going to bore you with the myriad. But I've sort of boiled it down to three discrete areas, okay? First thing, I like doing quotes with people that are like very much smarter than me and smarter than probably a lot of people. But Alexander the Great, I am indebted to my father for living, but to my teacher for living well. And some of you guys may have an Alexander the Great in your classroom, okay? So think about that. Think about what he said. Think about what it means. His father gave him physical life. This teacher taught him about the world. Well, areas we're going to cover. Non-custodial parent issues. You're wondering, eh, what, huh? What's that? Well, we'll get to that. Bullying issues. We all know what that means, right? I told these three ladies here in the front row, they wanted the front row, so I'm going to have to pick on them a little bit, okay? So I'm going to bully you a little bit. All right? No, we're not going to do that. And then supervision issues, okay? Um, this will not be exhaustive. There will be things that I will not touch. And there will be time for questions, okay? So, in, and if, if during the presentation you have questions, I'm very informal. You may have gathered that, okay? And so ask your questions. Raise your hand, and, and if I don't see you, you know, snap your finger, say, hey, whatever. Get my attention, okay? Non-custodial parent situations. Okay, this is what I'm talking about. Here's the situation you may have. Oh, by the way, I'm not good at PowerPoint. I do all my own PowerPoints. And if you want it, I'll give it to you. But it's really not very much good without me. So <laughs> anyway, here's the situation you may have or may face. You have a, students in your class, or a student, where the parents are divorced. Mom comes to the school, the local Adventist school, and enrolls Johnny or Janie in your class. You know there's a father somewhere, obviously, but you've never met Dad. You don't know who he is. You don't know where he lives. He does not come to the Christmas play. He does not come to see you and to find out anything about Johnny, okay? He's not involved. One day, the principal gets a letter from Dad's lawyer. He wants the school records. Is this ringing a bell with any of you? Okay. What do we do now? Call you. Oh, well, you, you. Sure, you can always call me. I, no, 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 that's not the right answer. But that's not, that's not too bad. Um, let, let, me, let me explain something to you. You guys have a tremendous support system with your conference administration. You got some very smart people there. You got some people who understand a lot of this, the grind of these issues. And so, you know, I would recommend that you start with your Office of Education in Calhoun. They may call me, or you may want to conference in or something, but initially, this is what you do. Getting a letter from a lawyer is generally not the, one of the more pleasant things that will happen to you in the course of a day. It's a little bit intimidating. You don't know why they're writing to you, what do they want the records for, and a lot of questions go through your mind. So what do we do now? Okay. The, the answer is it depends. <laughs> uh, who gets the school records? When you have any family enrolling a child in your school, okay? Any family, divorce, together, single parent, whatever. Who gets the records? Custody, okay? That's good, all right. Let's go back to my example. The court order, which you've never seen, so you don't know who has custody. You just know this is Johnny's mommy. So you assume that she's got some level of custody. And you've never met dad. Okay. Does your school provide more than one set of records? Sometimes. Okay. When? When do you provide more than one set of records? Okay. Over, let's say Johnny's been in this, let's change the facts a little bit. Johnny's been in the school two years and, and you don't see dad or his lawyer. And what about the fact that you do provide the set to the lawyer? It's getting harder, isn't it? No subpoena, no court order, just a letter. Who's, who's a principal in here? There's some, I know there's some. 
Okay. Uh, the, the, uh, but raise your hands again. I need to pick on you. Did you raise your hand? You raised your hand. What's your name? Vicky. Vicky. Okay, Vicky. You didn't get the front row, but we're going to pick on you anyway. <laughs> All right. Who gets the records? When? What? No, no. Let's go back. Do you send the records to the lawyer? I write you a letter on behalf of Dad. A dear Miss Vicky, you have my client's son in third grade. I would like his, uh, his father would like his records and he's instructed me to write you to obtain them. Please send them to my office at da 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 I will pay, pay reasonable copying costs and postage. Very truly yours, Robert H. Burrow, for the non-existent father. Okay, so you do not send them to Dad's, well, why not? Uh, there's no, I don't have any documentation or court order or anything that shows that that parent has access to that. Okay, that's reasonable. But I would first call Connie. Okay, call Con <laughs> calling Connie is never a bad thing to do, okay? Because Connie knows a lot about this stuff, and she's got a lot of good, solid answers. She and I confer from time to time on, on you know, sticky wickets, as they say. And, uh, and I think, by and large, that, well, first of all, I think the, the school systems here are, and the school you know, districts are run very well. And that's not an accident. And that's not the way it is everywhere. So, yes, sir. Um, I would talk to the mom and see if she could bring in a copy, you know, the court order, and see who is custodial. And if she signed away or saying that he could have it, if she was only the owner custodian, then I would send it. Excellent idea. The other thing you might do with mom is say, listen, why don't you send dad a set of the records? You know, what I'm getting at here, oh, no, I'm sorry, you go ahead. I was just going to say that normally, whenever I have a parent that or a child that I do not know both, I ask the mother right on from the beginning to show me, give me a set of copy of the court order or the best custody, and am I to send records to the father or am I not to? And therefore, if something like this comes, the first thing I do is contact the mother. That, that's an excellent suggestion. Because mom's the only one who has enrolled Johnny in your school. She's the only one who's financially responsible. She's the only one that has showed up to the parent-teacher conferences. She's the only one that is involved in Johnny's life to the extent you can see it. Okay? Yes, ma'am. That's a good idea. So you have a policy in, in which the, the enrolling parent must instruct you in writing to send forms to dad who's not around. Or, you know, my, I, I don't want to pick on dad all the time, but it's just easier that way. Okay? Uh, well, I'm a dad too, so, you know. Um, but no, that's, that's actually a, a very good solution to the problem. But I'm telling you, I'm, I'm speaking about this subject with you all today because it's, it's something that is a repetitive problem in our school systems. Yes, sir? What happens if you send it and you weren't supposed to, then what type of trouble? You don't necessarily get into any trouble, but I'm, I'm getting to that. The trouble you're going to get into is what's happening here, folks, and I'm going to tell you what's happening here is mom and dad are still, let me put my glasses down. Okay? And what they're trying to do is to drag you and your school into that debate. Now, what's your job with respect to little Johnny? Teach him. <laughs> mom and dad, now, their relationship will impact your teaching. It will impact his learning. Obviously. And, and again, I'm not an educator, but some of these things, you know, you just know. You know better than I do that that's so. But you're not going to resolve mom and dad's issues. <clears throat> the best you can do is to, you know, twist a little arm to make sure that, you know, we, we all act like adults and keep Johnny's education at the forefront. And that's what your job is. So how do you respond to the attorney? Uh, the, the lady back here with the green blouse, I'm sorry you're in the back row. You didn't want front row, did you? Well, that was very smart. Um, that's a good solution. That's a very good solution. To have the enrolling parent instruct you. So that way when the lawyer writes to you, 
What do you, how do you respond to the lawyer? Yes. Show them the paper that says the Bingo. Let me make a suggestion. Dear Ms. Lawyer, is principal of the Acme Elementary School in Acme, Tennessee, I used to watch Looney Tunes when I was a kid, so. Um, uh, we have a policy. The enrolling parent is entitled to a set of med uh, medical um, school records. If he or she instructs us to release the, such records to the non-enrolling parent, we do so. In this case, your client's ex-spouse instructed us in the opposite. Accordingly, your, your client will need to get the records from his ex-spouse. Sincerely, Principal, what's your name? Leanne. Principal Leanne. Done. You're done. And you've put the battle back where it belongs. Bob? Yes? Uh, you made reference a little earlier. You're talking about the dad. He, he didn't enroll the child. The child doesn't stay there. Uh, doesn't pay the bill. Mm -hmm. What happens if dad's paying part of that school bill? If he's enrolled the child, if he's in a, and he is uh, financially responsible, I think you do owe a set of records to, the, to the, that parent. Um, I tried to make this an easier example with an absentee parent with respect to the school. It, it gets muddier the more involved the separated spouse becomes, but the truth is you, you have no reason to withhold the records. If, if dad is involved and financially responsible and involved at school, you'll want to advise and, and update him on what's going on with his child. In the example I gave, I, again, I try to make it easy. You, don't even, you know there's a father, right? Because, I mean, but you don't, you don't know who this person is. You don't know where he lives. You don't know if he cares. You know, and your job is not to play detective and figure out who, where Johnny's father lives. He could be, you know, commercial fishing in Alaska for all you know. So, yeah, I mean, I think the closer and the more involved, I think you have to make accommodation for families that are not in, you know, not together anymore for whatever reason. Well, here's, here's one other one. In the situation of incarceration of the father, uh, we had, we had uh, written the request uh, by him uh, while he was incarcerated. He had a copy of the child's records. And um, we, we, we complied with that. Yeah. We had nothing that said he was not supposed to get anything. I know the mother didn't want any contact directed between child and parent or and father. But we, we uh, have submitted, you know, stuff. In the situation you're describing, though, it doesn't appear to me, from what you've described, that da incarcerated dad is trying to drag you into a fight with his ex-spouse. That's the only reason to deny records or to, to, to basically treat this person at arm's length. If, if they're trying to get you or your staff involved in their fight, in their dispute, that's when you need to put up the roadblocks. If it's just two people whose marriage didn't work out, but they're not trying to drag, where are you principal, at Spalding? Okay. They're not trying to drive, drag Spalding or its administration or staff into their you know, familial problems. I have no problem with giving them the records. Who was first? Okay. <laughs> From the money and more, grandparents, child lives with the grandparents. Do they have custody? No. Who enrolled the child in the school? Then you give the grandparents the records. If they're paying, if they're yeah. the ones paying. Yeah. You know, I, I think in that situation, I would try to, to determine, you know, where the parents are. You may have a situation where the parental rights have been terminated, or the parents may be deceased, or, you know, who knows. And they just went to live with grandma and grandpa, but there was never a judge that put his blessing or her blessing on it. For all intents and purposes, that, those set of grandparents have custody. The court never put its blessing on it, but that's who you send the records to. Yeah. Can you, can you, to avoid it, that just ask for a copy of the parenting plan to, that dictates so it's not mom saying, no, I don't want him to have a copy of it, but he has the right to a copy of it, even if she enrolled him and he's not paying it because it was her choice. You can do that. Again, the goal here is not to exclude either the parents. The goal is to avoid one parent dragging you as the educator into his fight or her fight with the ex-spouse. So if you always follow the parenting plan, then you're not in 
you should be fine. Yeah, and if that's what you do, yeah. Uh, again, you're trying to sniff out that, that attempt to, to hook you into their fight and, and to head it off at the pass. Um, okay. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Mm -hmm. And I asked her, do you have custody? She said, no. I said, then if you want school records and so forth, or if you want to be, I have a note from the mother who has custody saying, I can give you what you need. Okay, this is a grandparent who, right. who claims she does not have custody. Right, but she takes care of the child. She's been with her okay. but she says, I don't have custody. I said, then you have your, the one that has custody, send me a letter stating that I can give you the records so you've required a, a note from the custodial parent uh, releasing you, uh, uh, releasing you to, to provide them with the records. That's fine. You can do that. Uh, I, I think I would dig a little deeper than that. The grandmother may say, I don't, I don't have custody. Custody can either come by a, by a judge ordering it or what they call by operation of law. If my wife and I pass away and my kids go to live with my sister, and she doesn't go to court and get the judge's blessing on that, after a period of time, by operation of law, she has custody. So what do I need to see the custody papers? You should ask for the custody papers. You should ask, for, to d ask the grandparent if the parents are living, what the family situation is, why is she raising these children. It's, it's a legitimate question beyond this issue uh, because you want to know what's going on in this child's life as, as their teacher. Um, I mean, you don't want to, I mean, you have to, obviously, and you all have, know this, you don't want to dig too many peels past that onion because it gets into the none of your business zone. But I think you have the right to ask why, you know, how am I to communicate with little Johnny's father or mother? And let that, it'd be that the segue into, well, they've had, they passed away in a tragic auto accident last year, or, you know, dad left and we don't know where he is, or whatever the story is, you know, you, you ask a sort of a, a question that's an invitation for them to tell you uh, about the family situation. Yes, ma'am. How does it look to them when you have temporary custody, but there's no date on the temporary custody? How's that? Well, that's temporary custody. Yeah. Temporary custody. Uh, an, an order from the court granting temporary custody? The question is about how do you deal with the situation where there's temporary custody granted, um, and the, but there's no date, no expiration date. Well, the court is, if there's no date, then the temporary custody is valid until the court enters a final order. And so you, you abide by the temporary custody order until, and you, and you basically put it on the parent to advise you at what point the custody situation is finalized. So that's, that's how I would deal with that, yeah. So, okay, how do you deal with, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. get to subpoenas, but you did the right thing, just, just so you know. Don't be afraid to pick up the phone. You should call the conference or your principal and let him or her know that you've been subpoenaed, okay? Uh, you should, you, you know, it, but subpoenas are court orders and you have to comply with them unless you have somebody to go in and fight to what they call quash the subpoena, which means basically stamp it out. Um, and I, I won't go through the war, so I'm going to get to subpoenas here. But no, you did the right thing to call the lawyer and say, hey, what do you want? Because usually those subpoenas are very broad. And they're really only looking for like one piece of paper or something. Anyway, um, provide a framework for this stuff. Have a policy that, um, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, the lady with the green blouse in the back. Leanne. Leanne, you have a policy. I don't know if it's written down or anything, but you have a policy, okay? Communicate the policy. You've done that. You have the parent enrolling the child. Fill out this form. That's communicating the policy. Exceptions should be few and easily explained. 
When you, when you make an exception to policy, it, first of all, you shouldn't unless you have a really, really good reason. And if you do, as I said, they should be few. And you have to be able to explain, why did we go off the template here? Why did we make this exception? And really, you should memorial, uh, you should uh, write this down. <laughs> Sorry, Connie. Uh, memorialize this. <laughs> um, uh, it's a long story, but I won't get into that. But the, at any rate, because you're not always going to be the teacher at the Spalding Elementary School's third grade class. Or you're not always going to be the principal there. Um, and I haven't had the pleasure yet of meeting you, but you know, I'm Murray, but we've talked. Okay? And someday you'll have a, you'll have a successor. And that successor needs to know why you deviated from policy. And the only way that happens is if there's some paper trail. So anyway, um, policy reasons. Um, if restrictive, okay, restrictive meaning non-custodial parent doesn't get the, the records. You have to have a reason for that. Here's one reason, financial responsibility. He who pays or she who pays gets the records. I don't know, it's nice and simple and clean. Um, and again, if both parents are paying, they both get. If both are financially responsible. Only one set for, per family. You could make that. Hey, you know, those Xerox papers add up, right? Got a budget? Trying to cut here and there? One set for, per family. Here. You know, it's like throwing raw meat into a cage and a bunch of wild dogs. Here, you fight it out. Figure out who gets Johnny's report card. You can do it that way. Not the best way, but you can do it. I like the financial responsibility one, okay, but that's just me. I think it has a certain rationality to it. Um, and it, and, and you, can impl you can inflict guilt on the non-paying parent. Why should I give you, you're not even paying for this. You know, and so, yeah, you have an argument. Uh, anyway, uh, communicate your policy. State it in your handbook, on a website. You all have websites, some of your schools, yes? On the website, on the application, letters, or in response to specific inquiries. <clears throat> okay, another problem with families that have, uh, you know, custodial issues is pick up and drop off, because pick up and drop off is often the place where Little Johnny goes to spend his two nights with Dad that week. Mom drops him off in the morning. Dad picks him up in the afternoon. Sometimes there's problems with this because Dad gets mad because Johnny didn't come to school with clean clothes and his lunch packed. Now, you see what's happening here, right? This isn't about Johnny's clothes or the lunch. This is about we're going to get the teacher involved in our little, you know, contest, okay? You need to have a policy. Who gets to pick Johnny up? I don't know how you do that. They have sort of a cattle call at Spencerville where my child attends. It, the cars line up, you know, and we have these little laminated, our names, you know, Burrow. So they see that laminated thing in my windshield. I know most of the teachers there, and so I really wouldn't need it. But for some, they, you know, parents, parents are involved to different degrees. And so when they see that, they have a little radio, Send Aaron up, his dad's here to get him, you know, that type of thing. That's how they do it there. Maybe some of you all have different ways of doing it. I don't know. But if you have a system in place, you'll avoid a lot of this. Yes, ma'am. That's the right answer. Because you can't just release your, the child to, hey, I'm, I'm Uncle Bob, and I'm here to pick up my niece, Lauren. Well, I may or may not be Uncle Bob, and furthermore, Mom didn't authorize Uncle Bob to pick up niece, Lauren. Once in a while, there's an emergency, and the parent will call and tell us That's that fine. we get a picture, we make a copy of the driver's license of the person who's picking up the 
files to make sure that we have that document. That's absolutely the right thing to do. You, you want to have authorization from the enrolling parent as to who has the ability or the right to pick up the child. Uh, people will talk about their parental rights, and, and people do have parental rights. We still live in the United States, but you are a private entity, okay? And what anyone, if I enroll my child in, in your school, Christine, my rights are what you and your administration and the conference put in the handbook. That's it. And if I don't like the rights you haven't given me, I can vote with my feet. That's how it works, you know? Uh, lawyers will sometimes get involved in this, but again, I think we've covered that enough. And then court orders. I've had parents come in and they say to, uh, just one moment, and they say to um, uh, the principal, I have a court order that she has to let me have Johnny on Thursday afternoon. And I've gotten calls, the principal's in a panic. It's a court order, and, and th th it's a very easy answer. That order applies to the ex-wife. It does not apply to Greenville, is it elementary school? At Greenville Adventist Academy. You know, and I, I will, I'll call the guy and I'll say, you know what, do you see Greenville Adventist Academy on that court order? Anywhere? No. Well then Greenville Adventist Academy is not subject to that court order. A judge ordered dad or ordered mom. And they have to work it out with the school. You know, it's called being an adult. And anyway, um, yeah. Yes, I, no, I'm going to go. I'm sorry. I'm, uh, I usually do ladies first, but anyway, go ahead. Um, if, if the teachers are not specifically listed on the parental permission, is, do they have, is it legally, legally okay for them to drop a student off on the way home or something like that? In the case of that, a situation arises that's like that. Um, I don't, I, I like to have it on the application at the beginning that a, a release or an, at least an acknowledgement that teachers will transport students from time to time to various events. The issue of taking a child home gets into another can of worms that, that we're not going to be able to cover today. And that's something we can talk privately about, but that can be a real can of worms. Yeah. And we'll, we'll get into that. If you want to, I'll give you my card, we can talk, okay? But I like having that because teachers do have to transport students from time to time. It's part of your job. And I like having that on the application. Uh, you, Shannon. Uh, pardon? Shannon. Shannon. Okay. Um, we had a situation in the school I was in before where a child had a, there was a restraining order against the mother. Mm -hmm. And over Christmas, it had been several months since the restraining order, and over Christmas, the dad relented, and on Christmas Day, the child wanted to see mom, and he allowed that. Well, when he went to pick the child up, um, the mother wouldn't let him have him. When the police showed up, the police had believed the mom's story and wouldn't give him the child anyway. He called the school in January, and the child was not there yet and um, wanted me to call him and let him know when the child got there to school and make sure he was okay and everything. I had the police actually call me and tell me that they were considering the restraining order obsolete, gone, whatever, Expired. because he had allowed the child to see mom on right. Christmas. <clears throat> and so anyway, the policeman was kind of almost, he was very forceful with the situation, saying that it was okay for the mom to pick the child up now. And I said, I have a restraining order in my file yeah. here that this child cannot be picked up. And so I said, we're going to have a situation here at the school. And so basically he started back paddling on that restraining order. And the policeman actually came to the school at the end of the day, had the dad pick the child up 30 minutes early. So when mom got there, he can it handle. would be a situation. But the policeman kind of can't me. A police officer can't change a restraining order. That is for a judge. And the, the truth is, the question is about restraining orders and, and in, in, a, in a nutshell, how a principal or teacher must respond to a restraining order. Again, without seeing the order, I'm not sure I know the answer to that because the, the order may be, it, she may violate the order by picking up, picking up. The restraining order is against her, not against your, you or your school. And you're not obligated to enforce that. You may choose to enforce it, but you are not obligated to enforce that. So if you let mom pick the child up, 
she will have violated the judge's order and would be subject to contempt, which the judge just throws you in the hooskow for a few days to cool your jets or fines you or something. But that said, you do not, you are not obligated, although it may be a good management tool to take, take a line where you're not going, you're, you're going to comply with it, it for, her, for her sake, frankly. Um, all right, let's talk about teachers' testimony in divorce custody cases. We've touched on this. I'm sorry. Back to his question. When we have the kids fill out that paper that says everyone they can leave with, mm -hmm. I inform the parents, if you're ever going to need me to take your child home, I need to be on the list. Well, that's, that's another way to handle it, sure. You can handle it by getting, getting a, a, an initial with all teachers and staff at, where do you teach? In Pikeville, but it's just Pikeville. two of us, so if they're going okay. with... Uh, and so I always just have them, and most of our parents have us on their list. But that, yeah, that's a legitimate way to handle it, is to put you on the list, or to again, have it in the application that parent consents and understands that teachers and staff at the school will from time to time be transporting the parents initial here. You can do it that way too. Can email uh, permission? That a it's fine, I mean, it's, it's not ideal, but I, I like having a real signature, but it's not, you know, there's, there's no, um, I've had the dog ate my homework excuses, you know, oh, well, my six-year-old sent the email, not me. Uh, you know, I, judges have little patience for that type of dog ate my homework uh, argument. Okay, divorce, custody situations, teacher is subpoenaed. Come to court and testify. You get a letter that's a nice little invitation from the court to show up on a particular date and talk about Johnny and Mr. and Mrs. Smith's home. Okay? <clears throat> the subpoena part's easy. You have to show up or you hire counsel or you have the conference hire counsel to move to quash the subpoena, to stamp it out. It's an old Celtic term or something. Um, you're, again, your job's to educate the child. It's not to take sides. But your testimony may have the effect of helping or diminishing a argument by one of the parents. If you notice that every day the child comes back from mom's care over the weekend, he's not fed well, he's not clothed well, he's overly tired, and you are asked under oath about those observations, you have to tell the truth. What I discourage, and I think what this conference discourages, is voluntarily getting yourself involved in these situations. Now, as a teacher, you're gonna, you do care about these children, obviously. You have a, an emotional bond towards them. And you may wanna sit down with the parents and say, look, mom, you know, get him to bed before midnight, will you? He's nodding off in math, which I understand is not, you know, the most interesting subject for him, but he's got to stay awake at least. Or dad, you know, it, this is the laundry soap, you know, this is the laundry detergent. Throw the jeans in, turn it on wash, you know, it'd be nice if he had some clean clothes once or whatever you do. But when you, but I've had situations, not here in Southern Union, but in other places where teacher will write a letter to the judge saying that, you know, one parent or another is a louse, you know, and no, <laughs> no, okay? You don't want to do voluntary testimony. Make them subpoena you and then just go and tell the truth. And if you're not asked something, I don't want to prepare you as witnesses, but answer what you've been asked. Do you know your name? What's the answer? Yes. I forgot your name. Huh? If you said carry, that would be the wrong answer. But yes, no, or I don't remember. Those are your three options to that question. Okay? Sorry, I told you you're on the front row, you know. But I'm sorry. Um, get, you, get a subpoena. If a lawyer calls you and says, will you come and do a deposition for me? Subpoena me. Send me a subpoena. That gives you cover. They didn't have a choice, okay? Enough said. Uh, conference input. You want to tell the conference if you've been subpoenaed. You want them to know. Sometimes 
testimony will go to attack the school system because sometimes the goal is not child custody or anything. Sometimes the goal is to pull Junior out of that weird Adventist school where they go to church on the wrong day and put him in the public school where he can learn that good evolution science, see? So uh, that's, that's where you want your conference people along for the ride, okay? And counsel. You want, you want a lawyer. You want to talk to a lawyer. You, you want to talk to somebody here locally. I will talk to you. I will tell you what I know. I practiced law for the last 17 years in the state of Maryland. Last time I checked, that was not within the confines of the Georgia Cumberland Conference. So you, you're going to need somebody here locally, which I can help you with. Connie can help you with. Dr. Geddes can help you with. Um, okay, remember, your job is to educate the student. Okay, enough said. Let's move on to bullying, all right? Bullying is aggressive behavior that is intentional. It involves an imbalance of power and it often repeats. Okay, we're not talking about one fight in the schoolyard over, you know, your sister who I just broke up with won't return my leather jacket. No, that's a real case. I don't make this stuff up. Um, <laughs> The behavior has many forms, okay? Bullying, examples, punching, hitting, we all understand that. Teasing, name calling, you know, the verbal stuff. Intimidation through gestures. See, I never got this growing up, but girls are great at this, about sixth grade, you know? The whole exclusion thing. Uh, but sorry, ladies. But you all know I'm telling the truth, right? I mean, that's right. And guys are more like, physical about it, but anyway, it's, it's a dis different, different um, type of mean. Um, insulting email or text messaging, cyber bullying. Have any of you seen the public service, I said this yesterday, nobody had seen it, the public service announcement where there's an adolescent girl walking around with her cell phone and there's a little guy superimposed there. What are you doing now? Are you having supper now? And just constantly texting her with all these questions. And she's just kind of looking zombified there with this sort of deer in the headlights look. And, um, and, the, and the, the, the point of the public service message is that this guy is stalking her with his cell phone. And that, you know, that, you know folks, you need to be prepared or what's going on with your daughter and da 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 da. That was the message. But it was a good example, I think, of what we're talking about here. And I don't do text because these hands just don't, you know. But. Uh, but this is something that they can do very quickly, and, and it can be used to, to intimidate. Um, text and email, we've had email situations where people have taken, and you know, we're going to keep this G-rated, but uh, photographs of each other that shouldn't be sent over the email, okay? <laughs> and uh, the, you know, this, this, this is a problem. This is a problem that, that your predecessors 30 years ago did not have to deal with, okay? but you do. All right, you have a bullying situation. We're gonna get into this, but I want, I want to give uh, Connie an opportunity to talk to you about how, what you're to do in these situations, what the conference does for you, and what the conference and my office help you with. But we have a situation where you have a situation where there's a lot of bullying going on and you don't have control of it and you need help, okay? You, you, you've called the conference. You've spoken to Connie. I'm, do I need to, I'm gonna, okay. Uh, I'm gonna give her the mic. Mics. <laughs> I'm sorry. Tiny both? Tiny both. Yes, you do. Tiny both? Yes. First of all, I'm happy to get that off your ear. Yeah. It's driving me crazy because it's sticking me out. <laughs> oh, okay. But I couldn't do anything about it from the back row. Well, I'm sorry. My ear or the mic? Yeah, this. Okay. <laughs> And the second problem was, his introduction makes it sound like I know what I'm talking about, and I don't here, but what I, I'm learning is that each school has varying forms of this, um, the bullying issues. And um, recently, uh, a couple weeks ago, they had a conference call with the education office. And I don't see Cynthia, but someone here can give more information on, I'm sorry, I don't have it with me. It's um, Salvaging Sisterhood, I think was the name of the um, conference call. 
Mean girls and ugly clicks. Mean girls. And ugly clicks. And ugly clicks. The lady that was presenting that was excellent, in my opinion. I mean, she's been there. She's experienced it herself. She sees it in her school. She has good counsel um, to give teachers who are facing it. What was amazing to me was that it happens right there um, without you even realizing it a lot of times as a teacher. You, you're trying. You're trying to be alert and oriented to everything going on in your classroom. But these kids have their ways of communicating with each other and excluding or, you know, intimidating or teasing um, that you don't even, you're not even aware of. And I'm supposed to be holding both of these, aren't I? Sorry, Brian. I don't want to slip it on. I'm not going to be up here that long. But anyway, the point is, when you find yourself in any of these situations, like, like what Bob has already been referring to, <laughs> I'm a hand person. They'll both hold them right there. Um, when you find yourself in these situations, um, talk with your administration. Call your regional director. Call us if you want to have some help and not feel like you're on your own. Um, that's why we're there. Doesn't mean we have all the answers, but I know where to find him. And he has been, if you haven't already picked up on this, Bob Burrow has provided so much to Georgia Cumberland Conference, and I sometimes forget that we're not the only ones. I mean, he does have other conferences that he helps. Um, but we rely on him a tremendous amount, and he gets it. He understands. Um, he may not have spent time in your classrooms, but he gets what you're going through. He has the common sense as well as the legal side of it. And what a blessing to us. And I'm sorry to change the attention and the focus, but somebody just walked in the door. Amen. Welcome, yeah. Kevin Cossack. Wow. So cool. Really, really good to see you. Amen. Really good to see you. So glad. All right, Bob, I'm going to roll it back over to you and let you continue on with all this contraption. Just push that, that thing down. So it's not sticking way up. It's Kevin Coffey. Hey, uh, Kevin, I, I accept your invitation to come down here on the 4th and 5th, by the way. That's right. Kevin, I never got back to you. This. Yeah, so thank you, right. Kevin. I'm sorry I didn't get back to you before you. That's so, by the way, I accept and thank you for the invitation. Uh, anyway, Kevin had called me, and uh, I, I did not get back with him t in a timely way um, about this. But I understand you've had some health challenges, but the Lord is good and we're happy to see you. <clears throat> okay. How does he get out of the house in the morning? Um, okay, bullying characteristics. Let's talk a little bit about this. Huh? Oh, you don't like that? Oh, would you like chocolate, vanilla, or strawberry? Uh, yeah. I feel like the guy at the uh, McDonald's drive-thru, but um, anyway. I mean, I'll just hold this one, because I can, I can talk with only one hand. Uh, I can't, can't see that far. But anyway, bullying characteristics. Confident. We think of bullies sometimes as, as the, you know, the tough guy that's really a marshmallow inside. What the shrinks have found in their studies of, of these guys and gals is that that's not true. That many of them are confident. They have high self-esteem. They're physically aggressive. Um, they're pro, they have pro-violence attitudes. Okay. Uh, you know, they're the type of people that walk around with the t-shirt that says, you know, there's no problem in life that a sufficient amount of explosives can't solve. These type of people. You've seen those t-shirts? Okay, maybe not. They, they, they sell them on the boardwalk in Ocean City, Maryland, along with things that I couldn't repeat in a decent crowd. But uh, anyway, uh, they're hot-tempered, easily angered, you know? Low frustra tolerance for frustration. Don't get in their way, you know? The locker doesn't open just right, they smack the little kid next to him, you know, that type of guy or gal. They, they, but they have and make friends. Maybe it's, you know, like Don Corleone type of friends, you know, I got a deal, you, you know, you cannot refuse, that type of friend. But at any rate, um, the, these are what, you know, a lot of the people who have studied this have found. Um, 
The victim characteristics are pretty stereotypical of what we think. They're anxious, insecure, weak, physically weak. I don't mean they're weak intellectually or weak people, but physically. Uh, they have low self-esteem. They don't have good social skills. They're isolated socially. You guys all have seen this, right? In your careers as teachers. You've seen both of these kids many times, some of you, okay? Um, misfits, that's how they're characterized. They don't fit in with the rest of the kids. Um, they, you've heard the expression, you know, when you're confronted, it's flight or fight. These are flight people. You know, these are not the rat in the corner that turns and bares its teeth. These are the kids that run. And when they get caught, they get beat, is what happens to them. Um, there is a relationship between bullying and supervision. In order for a bully to get away with bullying, in most cases, there has to be isolation from authority. You guys are the authority in the school. Right? So when these things happen, when, when they're not in eye or earshot of you. Now, Connie's right. In, in the, in the high-tech world, and the, for, for those of you who, are, who have a, more experience than others, you probably have seen the, you know, the look, the glance, the glare, that type of thing. Maybe some of you that are younger know that, too. Uh, OK? But the texting stuff. I don't know how you deal with that except to ban cell phone phones from the classroom, which you know I would recommend, frankly. But I don't know. I mean, that's your business. I don't. I don't run schools. Um, but that's really the relationship. Where does bullying occur? Restrooms, ladies. You. I presume you do not go into the restroom with the young men that you teach. Correct. That's a good idea. <laughs> um, yet. Uh, restrooms are places where bullying can occur. I'm not exactly sure what the answer is to that. Time limits. If you have if you have male teachers there that can, you know, roust them along. Uh, separation, sending them in. In I don't know. I mean, it. it but these are the, it does happen. There classrooms. Bullying occurs in the classroom. You know, uh, recess. You're out there looking around. You know, 50 yards away, there's two guys standing there talking. You know, yeah, that's nice, you know. Hank is talking to Bob. Well, what Hank is saying is, you know what, you give me your lunch money, or when the teacher goes in to take us in, I'll only have about two minutes, but I will mess you up in those two minutes. Do you understand? And he's standing there smiling the whole time, and, and the teacher's like, ah, it's really not, you know, no, not that you, I don't mean to imply that you're that naive, but it can happen before school. How many of you have parents that leave their kids off way before school opens? Yeah, that's a problem, isn't it? Yeah, that's a problem because sometimes, and I've had a case, I have a case in Puerto Rico. A lady leaves her kid off at 6.30 in the blessed AM. Nobody's there. The kid injures his finger in a door jam. And now she's suing the East Puerto Rico conference. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, well, we won't go there. Uh, lunch, lunch, it happened during the lunch hour. Locker rooms and after school, okay? How do we manage the bullying issue? Um, I don't stand before you as somebody has the answer to that, but this is a framework that I think will work for you. If it's a, if it's a problem if, at your school or if it isn't, to your knowledge, get your board involved, which means getting your administrator involved first, and say, look, if this train hadn't made a stop at our school, it's coming. So we need to be prepared for how we're going to deal with it once we become aware of it. Get your board behind you. Have a policy. What will we do in the way of discipline? Discipline is not a dirty word. You know that. But you know, you, you got a lot of people who somehow think that, you know, if you discipline a child, that somehow this is going to cause them to head to the shrink for three years. No. <laughs> Children need discipline. I'm not the disciplinarian in my home. My wife is. But I'm not oblivious to the fact that my children need discipline. 
um, publish your policy. At the beginning of the year, do you have like an orientation worship or something? We used to have those. Let them know. It, particularly if you have this issue at school. We had some bullying here last year, boys and girls. We're not going to this year. And here's what's going to happen to you. Raise the transaction cost of that behavior. Okay? Make it a job requirement. If for you administrators, make it a job requirement that your teachers seek this stuff out and report it to you. Okay? Get serious. Now, obviously, you know, we've, we've talked about that. Practice pointer. Report complaints or observations. Investigate complaints. Consider the nature of the act. I used to do something when I was in academy called a swirly. Anybody know what a swirly is? Okay, I won't repeat it here, but it's a disgusting practice. I was never on the receiving end of a swirly, and I, I'm proud to stand here before you and tell you I was never on the giving end of such an act. But I observed a few of them, and um, for those of you who don't know, you can come up and talk to me, or, or that gentleman over there in the white shirt, uh, he'll tell you about it. Um, it is awful. Uh, you better believe it. You better believe it. Oh, yeah. Um, consider the age of the offender. Consider the number of offenses. You know, is this the first time you've had a problem with Hank? Sorry if anybody's named Hank out there. Or is this the, you know, 77th problem? And I know in the Bible the Lord commanded us to forgive, you know, what was it, 777 times? I'm not good with math. But, you know, forgiveness is one thing. Running a school is another. Somebody can get forgiveness for these acts, but you may not be able to deal with this child in your school. Um, is it an isolated or repeated offense? Um, practice pointer, respond. You find out this stuff's gone on. The cyber stuff, the intimidation stuff, the less physical stuff. The physical stuff you're going to be able to sniff out pretty easily. The, the, the subtle stuff, the really mean stuff, the, the spreading rumors, you know, about stuff. That's going to take a little more, you know, what I call gumshoe or pick and shovel work on your part. But once you got the facts nailed down, you got to discipline these kids. You may need to expel a child. Part of the problem with bullies in many cases is that there, there's problems at home. So, you know, you know this. My dad used to say, my dad was in a, a, a principal for a while in his career. He used to say, you know, the parents have the first six or seven years to basically make the kid a mess, and then they send them to you, and you're supposed to shine them up and make them perfect. And you know that. You know you've had this. You understand what I'm talking about. But if the parent isn't going to get on board with you and play ball, you know, you may need to do, to, to, to ask them to, you know, continue their education elsewhere. In a serious matter where there's weapons involved, and I don't know whether you have this or not, get law enforcement involved. Call the police. Somebody brings a gun to school, you call the police. That's not anything to mess around with. Um, port complaints or observations. If something happens in your classroom and, the, and, the, and it's not been resolved, or even if it has been resolved, if it's serious enough, tell the next teacher. Now, I know, I mean, you don't want to, like, you know, sully this kid, right? But you got to. You got to tell the next teacher because that teacher deserves to know what he or she is dealing with. Get the parents involved. Now, sometimes that's a losing proposition, as we've already discussed. But if it's not, get them involved. You know, get, shake them by the lapels. You know, kids that are bullies have a higher incarceration rate. They get less educated. They're more unemployed. You know, this is a path that if you can head it off, you, you, you turn the child to the point where they may end up actually being a decent human being. Otherwise, they have a better chance of, of really take their life taking a path that you, no parent wants their child to do. Okay, we're going to talk about general supervision issues. You want to give realistic expectations to your parents. You are not guarantors of anybody's safety. 
You can't be. None of you can be. Supervision is a joint effort, and when I say that, what I mean is you need to tell your parents, constituents, and your principal has to back you up. Principals, we're listening now. Parents have to tell the kids and have to instill in the kids that they are to obey you. That doesn't happen. Yeah, I know it sounds dumb and maybe somewhat uh, elementary, but that doesn't happen as much as it used to. And you guys have to, you know, if it isn't happening, you, you guys have to, and your principals have to, when you meet with these parents, you have parent-teacher meetings, um, tell them, I need you to do this. <coughs> Cooperation is a must. Administration must educate employees. Teachers take ownership. What grade do you teach? You're responsible for fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth, too. You see them out in the hall messing around, and you can't just, and I'm not saying you do this, but you wanted the front row. Uh, you can't just say, hey, that's not my fourth graders. And I know you don't do that. Okay? And administration, you have to support your teachers. You have to give them the support and the backup. If you have a problem with them, pull them in the office after the parents are gone, but you have to give them that support. How do you supervise? Reduce distractions. No cell phones. No PDA. No iPod. No, none of you do this, but I'm telling you. No talking to my friend, you know, Mrs. Jones, who I teach her little kid about, you know, whatever your interests are. Control the students. A little fear is a good thing. <laughs> you know? Not fear to the point of paralysis, but just so they understand, <laughs> you know, but raise the transaction costs of bad behavior pay attention have a plan beforehand if you have an injury or an incident if a child falls and you suspect there's a spinal cord injury what are you not going to do <laughs> bada bing what else are you not going to do panic. you're not going to panic you're going to call 911 first you're going to call mom and dad second or you're going to get somebody to do that for you, another teacher, the principal. You know, you're going to clear the air. Have a plan. Think about these things before they happen. Uh, if possible, have a backup for yourself. No matter what, and I'm winding down, that's all, almost. <laughs> supervision is always an issue. No matter what, when something goes wrong, your supervision style, skills, extent will be criticized. I'm sorry about that. That is a template of our society. Because nothing bad should ever happen to anyone. And if something bad does happen to someone, it's got to be somebody else's fault. OK? So, I'm sorry. You have many other really positive, rewarding things about your calling. This is not one of them. Uh, parents hold you to a standard they themselves cannot and do not meet. And that's the truth. And it's not fair, but I love these quotes. Confucius, expect much from yourself and little from others, and you will avoid incurring resentment. <laughs> it's true. Deserves got nothing to do with it. Does anybody know where that comes from? It's one of my favorite actors. Clint Eastwood from the film Unforgiven. Deserves got nothing to do with it. You don't deserve to be blamed for many of the things that you are blamed for. It's got nothing to do with it. And then, I don't deserve this award, but I have arthritis, and I don't deserve that either. My buddy Jack Benny. <laughs> With that, that's all, folks. If you have questions, I will entertain them. If not, we can break. My friend Carol. We have a policy of a three-day field trip. Yes. And that's the union the et cetera. Yes. Where are you? Yes. On a yearly basis. Yes. Can you speak to that and the responsibility that happens on day four or month four or whatever? The, a policy should in, be in place for a reason. And if the reason is they think that the conference has come to understand that after three days, you know, kids have a momentary lapse of reason and they get wilder or less safe or some other reason. But what is the reason for the three day policy? Until you know that, it's hard to address the other. But if it's a safety issue or a behavioral issue, then to deviate from that 
deviates from your own safety standard. And unless you have a cogent explanation as to why you did that, I'm dealing with all A-plus honor students who have never had a behavioral issue in their lives. Well, let, show me that group. Um, you know, or whatever, you should not deviate from your policy because presumably your policy is put in place for a good reason. And if you deviate from it, what you are ostensibly saying is that we're going to ignore those good reasons for which we have the policy. Now, policy should and must be examined periodically. If three days is, there's no rational, it's an arbitrary number, then perhaps it should be modified. I don't know. But going, at going violating your own policy basically sets you up for not only criticism amongst your peers and criticism from your constituents and customers, but it's, it makes for easy pickings for a lawyer. So, does that, okay. Yes? Well, we've heard a lot of good suggestions this morning. Would it not be better if we had a list from the conference so that we could follow? And it, we've all got special circumstances, but at least we have a guiding policy to go by. I think that the conference provides a lot of resources. Many of the things we've talked about this morning are, are very new problems that neither I nor, and I, I know the conference has a policy with respect to bullying. Dr. Geddes uh, set me straight yesterday. I didn't say you didn't, but I was not aware of it. In fact, she tells me I worked with them on that, but you know, I, you know, I, I don't, you know, I'm sorry. But at any rate, uh, I think there are resources available at the conference for much of this stuff not for everything, and, and these folk work very hard to develop guidance for you. Uh, you have quality people there. Is, is, the, is the wheel completely invented in every aspect? No, it is not, but that's, that's why we, you know, we keep on chugging along. So. Let me ask more. Yes, I, uh, the, our time for this presentation is up. We're going to break for lunch. I, I want to thank you all for listening patiently, and um, I, I appreciate that.